So today I want to share with you this letter I received from this man. But first I want to get into this scripture as a basis of this teaching. 1 Corinthians 14.33 states, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So God is not the author of confusion. So if he is not the author of confusion, who is? Who is the one who brings confusion, doubt, deception, twisting of the word of God, of the truths of God, of the doctrines of Jesus Christ? Second Corinthians states, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted, corrupted from the simplicity that is in who? Christ Jesus. The serpent, the devil, the dragon, Satan is the one who beguiles. He is the one who distorts and twists and confuses the people. So he is the author of confusion, not God. Now with this in mind, let us go on further into the teaching. Now let's get into this letter. There's no use of uh, stating who it's from. He states, First off, God bless you for your ministry and exposing sinners to the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. My question, after watching a few videos and some of your instructions, instructions videos concerning the verbiage used during baptism, I tried to remember what was said when I was baptized. Let's just stop there. He tried to remember what was said during his baptism. Now, this should throw up a red flag. If one doesn't remember what was declared or uh, stated over them, invoked over them at their baptism, their immersion in water, then that is something to be concerned about. And Paul talks about uh, the, the importance of a name be declared over them at baptism. We'll get into that in the future, but if you do not remember the name that was invoked over you or stated over you or called over you at baptism, called upon at baptism, then that is something to be concerned about. So this person doesn't remember what was said over him at baptism. But let's go ahead and read further. Peter said in Acts 2.38, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. But in the Great Commission, Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I am not discounting what Peter said, but I tend to believe what Jesus Christ said carries more authority. What are your thoughts? Kind regards. Obviously, he's sort of confused because he's asking for my thoughts. And it's clear here he doesn't remember what was pro, uh, proclaimed over him or, or called upon over him at baptism. So there's confusion there. And it's apparent, those of us who are in the faith of Jesus Christ and are considered my brethren who have been baptized in his name, we can see here that uh, there, is, there is more confusion because he has not deciphered or understood the word of God uh, clearly. That is why he's asking the question. And I'm not faulting him for this. As I stated, if he is sincere, the Bible tells us to correct, to instruct in righteousness. And that is my job as a minister of God. So he states that Peter said one thing, Jesus said another. And he tends to believe Jesus Christ over Peter. But he's not discounting what Peter said. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into Scripture. 2 Timothy 3 states, This is Paul speaking to Timothy. But thou, Timothy, has fully known my doctrine. My doctrine. What is my doctrine? What is the doctrine that Paul was abiding in? Well, we read in Acts chapter 2 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And Paul was an apostle. So even though he wasn't there at that time, of course, he was taught the doctrines. And he 
was abiding in the doctrine because he was teaching the doctrine. We see it throughout the epistles that he taught very well the doctrines of Jesus Christ. My doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, praise God. Yea, and all that will live godly in who? Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers, seducers, notice that word, seducers, that's the definition of beguile in the Greek. Satan beguiled Eve. He deceived her. He tricked her. Seducers shall wax worse and worse. That is why we see that there may be little hope to those who are abiding in false doctrine and choose not to come out to those who justify their confusion, justify their false teaching. There's little hope for them. Why? Because the Bible tells us clearly that seducers, those who are beguilers, those who are tricked, tricksters those who reside in false teaching shall what wax worse and worse notice deceiving and being deceived so they are being deceived by whom by the devil the one who beguiles satan the twister of the word of god the deceiver the serpent they have been deceived and in return or in response to their deception they are deceiving others, deceiving and being deceived. So the false teacher is not only under a strong delusion himself, but he transfers and transmits that false uh, teaching and delusion to others, and they receive it, and they too are abiding uh, in deception. But continue thou, you, Timothy, even though those around you are in false teaching, are being seduced, are waxing worse and worse, are deceiving and being deceived, uh, you're inundated around you uh, with, with false doctrine and teaching, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, whether it was through faithful men of God preaching sound doctrine, or most importantly, the Holy Ghost and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to what? Make thee wise, not deceived, but wised, unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Notice, all scripture, all scripture, not some, all scripture, that includes Peter's preaching and teaching, through his epistles. That includes Paul's preaching and teaching through his epistles, James, Jude, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Inspiration of God. And is profitable. Profitable. Well, the, the writer states, that wrote to me the letter, he states that, he believes that uh, uh, Jesus Christ's words are a little bit more uh, profitable or uh, carry a little bit more weight and authority, but he's not discounting Peter's uh, teaching. Now, how can we say that if we believe that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God? How can we say such a thing, that he, he, he holds in, in lesser weight and authority uh, the words of the apostles? When all scripture is given to us by the inspiration of God. Peter preached his first sermon there in full on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Jesus told his disciples, and Peter was present, to preach repentance and remission of sins. What? Beginning where? At Jerusalem. Where did Peter, Peter preach? At Jerusalem to the Jews. He preached repentance and remission of sins, Acts 2.38. All scriptures given by the inspiration of God. Oh, except for Peter's, except for Paul. You know, Paul was just a, you know, he hated, he hated the sodomite and uh, 
he was against women. No, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Notice, for doctrine. You have fully known my doctrine. Doctrine, the teachings, the sound teachings that cannot be moved, that are stable, that are written in concrete, so to speak, that will never change. The doctrine for reproof, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And that is what we do. We correct those who are out of line. We bring them back unto the sound doctrine. For instruction, this is what we do. We teach the sound word of God. As it says in the scriptures, we don't add terms, add certain phrases that are that are outside of the, the Bible to try to explain uh, sound doctrine. No. We speak as thus saith the Holy Scriptures, as thus saith the Lord, because the word of God is given by God, and we have to speak as oracles of God. When we begin to add our own phrases and terms and, and, and terminology that, that came from uh, sources outside of the Bible that, that man produced, then that is where the confusion comes in. The seducer comes in through extra biblical wording and phrases and terms. So we are to instruct those who are out of line in righteousness, in love, in peace. We want you to be wise. We want you to be sound in doctrine. We want you to, uh, to continue in that which you have learned from the beginning to understand the Holy Scriptures. We want to further and, 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 and get you further towards the kingdom of God. We want you to progress in your understanding, your knowledge of Jesus Christ by expounding unto you the Scriptures uh, through reproof, through correction, through instruction in righteousness. Now, once again, I say this. You will know a false teacher by the amount of slander and division that he causes and false accusation and lies and, and corrupt speaking and just all around evil. You'll see them. You'll know them, as Jesus said. You'll know them by their fruits. That the man of God, man of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Notice, perfect perfect what does this remind us of well acts eighteen twenty six, and he apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue now if you read a little further into acts 18 you'll notice that he was learned in the scriptures he had a boldness to his his speech and he knew the word of god uh, to an extent and he had a head knowledge of the things of god and he spoke boldly in the synagogue but notice whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, notice what did they do? They took him unto them, pulled him aside, and expounded unto him, expounded, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, expounded unto him the way of God, the way of God more what? Perfectly. The way of God more perfectly. And if you read... Uh, a little further in Acts, well, actually, right after that uh, episode in Acts, Luke shows us, right after Acts 18, uh, 26, in Acts 19, Paul does the same thing. He expounds unto the disciples of John the Baptist, the way of God more perfectly. And he says unto them in Acts 19, 2, have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? And many of you know this. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, what then were you baptized? And they said unto him, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So we see here that showing someone the way of God more perfectly is not something done out of hatred and seduction, 
to deceive them into some sort of evil. But no, it's to make them wise unto salvation. It's to push them forward towards the kingdom of God so that they might progress in their walk of, 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 and knowledge of God through reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And that is what Aquila and Priscilla did unto Apollos. They expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly and, and, and spoke to him concerning the doctrines of Jesus Christ, which included repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Because we see right after right after uh, the scenario with the uh, disciples of John the Baptist uh, encountering Paul, he expounds unto them baptism, rebaptism, in the name of Jesus Christ. And he lays upon them uh, his hands, and they receive the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues, magnify God, prophesy. So we see here that we are to progress in our understanding. And the one who wrote the letter, uh, I believe he's progressing. He's asking the question in sincerity uh, because he's, he's been confused. And as long as you remain in the false doctrine, you're going to continue to be confused. You're always going to have a doubt in you. And you're going to have that, that inkling of unassur unassurance that something is not right. Because it happened to me. <clears throat> when I was at a non-denominational church, at the beginning stages of my walk with God, I was uh, baptized in the Trinity, in tritheist, the tritheist way, uh, into three gods or three deities. But the name of Jesus Christ was not uh, called over me. And after that baptism, I knew something was not right. It was something in me that was telling me that something was not right. I was wondering why the name above all names was not called over me. And many of you know this story. I don't have to repeat it. You can watch other videos for that. But in short, the Lord led a brother my way. He taught me about, he led me to uh, the correct form of baptism, which is in the name of Jesus Christ. Then I was rebaptized, or officially baptized correctly uh, for the remission of sins. And the rest is history. Praise God. So what are the doctrines? Let's close this teaching up by taking a look at a few of the doctrines that are foundational, that are written in stone, so to speak, that Paul was referring to when he was speaking to Timothy that he has known the doctrines and that Timothy should also remain in the doctrine, doctrines, that which he had learned from a child. Number one, the gospel, that Jesus Christ truly lived. He was truly a man. He was more than a man. He was a prophet and he was the son of God. And as he stated, he would rise from the dead and he was crucified. He was placed in a tomb wrapped in fine linen and he is, his body and his body was nowhere to be found three days later. And the angel told Mary that he was no longer there. He had risen from the dead and he was seen by many infallible proofs and he ascended to the father and he's coming back again. That is the gospel. Amen. That he rose from the dead and he has been given all power. All power has been given unto him by the Father. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. Praise God. That's the gospel. That there is one God. Jesus knew this. The devils know this. The apostles knew this. The prophets knew this. And we born again Christians who are abiding in the truth of Jesus Christ. We know that there is one God. He is not divided. Beside him there is no Savior. Okay. He's not a multiplicity of gods repentance is essential it is a must it's an obligation of all men the bible says that at the times of ignorance god winked at but now he commands all men everywhere to repent it doesn't matter if you're a roman catholic if you're a buddhist monk if you're an atheist if you're a scientist if you're just a good old person that has never harmed anyone in your life you pay all your taxes you never run red lights you are obligated to repent all tribes, all nations are under this obligation of repentance, a heart of contrition, a heart of remorse, a change of mind. Old things pass away. All things become new. Repentance is part of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Remission of sins. And that only comes through baptism. That's not a sprinkling. It's not dousing with water. As we spoke about earlier, we're 
uh, water bottles are poured over a person's head and that's uh, sufficient baptism. That's a lie. That's from the deceiver, uh, the beguiler, Satan. Baptism we see in the scriptures is full immersion in water. You're buried with him in baz- baptism. You're risen with Christ to new life. Old things, all, all the old man goes down in the water and you come up in the likeness of Christ. Your sins are washed away. Ananias told Saul, told Paul, uh, why are you tearing? Arise, be baptized, calling upon the name of the Lord. Wash away thy sins. Praise the Lord. So remission of sins through baptism. Receiving of the Spirit of God, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus Christ baptizes his, his children with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, if any man would want the Spirit, let him ask the Father, and the Father will give it unto him. And and Jesus said, uh, Peter said in Acts chapter 2, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And we've seen this in Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, Acts chapter 2, and throughout the epistles that those who have the Holy Ghost, those who initially receive the Spirit of God, will have a manifestation of that, and they will speak in tongues and magnify God or prophesy after they speak in tongues. So baptism of the Holy Ghost is part of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And holy and righteous conduct before man and God. Uh, many people we come in contact with call themselves Christians and they feel that they have crossed, uh, what, it, what, is, what is that reference in Monopoly? Cross, go, collect 200 or something, <laughs> something of that effect. They think that they're, as another person put it, <laughs> an older gentleman, I'll never forget the way he put it. I hang my, <laughs> I hang my hat on John three sixteen. You can watch uh, the way he stated it in the video. I believe it's concerning the Baptist Church, how we preached out of how far has the Baptist Church fallen. But this man was adamant in in his statement that he said he hangs his hat on John three sixteen. Does he believe in holiness and righteous conduct? No. <laughs> but he hangs his hat on John 3.16. But he negates a holy and righteous conduct. He thinks that because he believes in John 3.16, he can live however he wants to live. He can act however he wants to act. He can support the abominations that are done throughout the land, and he's going to go to heaven. Well, that's a lie from the beguiler, from Satan. Okay, the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul constantly rebukes the Corinthians because there are those in the Corinthian church that have still not repented of their fornication. And he tells uh, uh, the Galatians as well that those who commit certain acts of sin shall not inherit God's kingdom. He, re- he tells them a second time. He tells the Corinthians almost a third time uh, that certain conduct, uh, as one is called a Christian, is not going to be accepted by God, and it will certainly bar them from God's kingdom. They shall what? They shall lose their inheritance. Essentially, uh, he he references Esau in Hebrews. So, holy and righteous conduct is a must. It's 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 a duty of the man of God. Amen. And that can only come through understanding uh, the ways of the Lord through reading His Word and and conforming to the image of Christ and yielding to the Holy Spirit rather than yielding to the flesh. And lastly, as we stated in the beginning, 1 Corinthians states, For God, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So to the man who wrote the letter initially that he believes that Jesus Christ's words carry more weight in Matthew 28 than Peter's uh, does in Acts chapter 238, well, this man is mistaken because Peter was the apostle of Jesus Christ. One of the well, he was one of the disciples, and he preached exactly how Jesus Christ told him to preach, which was repentance and remission of sins. And Matthew twenty-eight tells us of the name singular of the one in whom we should be baptized in, and there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that's at the name of Jesus Christ. All the authority has been given unto him. Matthew chapter twenty-eight in heaven and on earth. So it's in the name of Jesus Christ that the apostles baptized every single individual or in the name of the Lord Jesus. And likewise, us as Christians, we should also be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, period. Amen.
And this is my instruction. This is my reproof. This is my correction uh, to many of you out there who are confused. Uh, that you come out of that confusion and, and align yourself with the truth and the sound doctrine and teachings of the Word of God. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. May you go in Jesus' name.